Ladies and gentlemen, breaking free from a culture of corruption is a multidimensional topic. It's something which we as a country have spoken about for a very long time. In my own lifetime, my grandfather, Lionel Sukaran, for those of you who may not know that, was part of the delegation that went to Marlborough House to write the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago. I see Mr. Dumas here. My grandfather, whilst I was growing up, gave me a great privilege of his reflection, he having been a sitting politician himself, a man of, of note in terms of debate and contribution in Parliament. But his reflection on our Constitution was that we had hemmed ourselves into a difficulty which would bear fruit 50 years later. From his perspective, the discipline of many of our state entities, if I want to call it loosely that, the public service, for instance, the teaching service, for instance, that they would fall to the workings of the Public Services Commission, the Teaching Services Commission, the Judicial and Legal Services Commission, etc. And whilst in law there was sense in the separation of powers, etc., his fear expressed to me as a child, then not quite understanding, was that Trinidad and Tobago would work itself into inefficiency because we were regulated in an environment where people couldn't agree. And I heard Dion ask a second ago, what is Jamaica doing that Trinidad is not? I often reflect on that because the AG of Jamaica and I have a very close working relationship and we share a lot of issues and ideas and discussions, but in dealing with anti-corruption and in going to Jamaica as I did and sitting with the DPP in Jamaica, sitting with the Attorney General in Jamaica, sitting with the Contractor General, sitting with the major organized crime agency, MOCA, I asked them, how did you manage to create this major organized crime agency so easily? I said, how did you get over the constitutional hurdles? How did you manage to allow the borrowing of prosecutorial power when you don't have a police service type um, insulation which balances within what the Privy Council tells us we ought to have in certain well-known cases in Trinidad and Tobago? And my Jamaican colleague said to me, what are you talking about? constitutional challenge? Who would raise such an issue? I said, but in Trinidad and Tobago, we are fighting an issue where often we have to achieve three-fifths majority in our parliament as the lowest level of special uh, intrusion into fundamental rights. And very often you will not have an opposition that agrees with the government and therefore you're stillborn. They chuckled, they rocked back, and they said to me, my dear friend, it's like flying a plane whilst you're building it. We in Jamaica fly the plane while we're building it. And they found it rather amusing that we would even entertain that conversation. Now, I've just taken the opportunity just to reflect on Dion's insight into what are other countries doing differently. So let's start with doing more with less and where we are and our update on our anti-corruption statement to the United Kingdom, which the Prime Minister gave in May 2016. And let's say this. Yesterday we had a first-of-its-kind event in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. Looking at the newspapers today, you wouldn't realize that we had created history yesterday as a country. But permit me to say this. We have never had a government go in a public forum, open the books of Trinidad and Tobago with the public service speaking from the Ministry of Finance to tell us what our economic position is against facts and data from the central bank and then open the microphone to the entire floor and that forum included private sector labor was invited but declined the invitation and it included of course the public service and in that environment trinidad and tobago was shown that our revenue from corporation taxes for oil and gas dropped from 19.8 billion dollars u.s in 2015 to $2 billion. I'll let that settle for a little while. Our debt escalated 263% over 10 years. Our revenue looks close to what our revenue in 2008 looked like, except 
our expenditure is three times what it was then. The Minister of Finance, in request to, for an answer coming from none other than Chalk Dust himself, as to why Carnival should continue to be supported, and that the statement having been made that Calypsonians will not go out next year because they were not being funded, the Minister of Finance said something which I didn't know. He said in, in 1990, no, it was in 2001 or 2002, that there was a ring down fight in the cabinet over the contribution to the sector, which was then $8 million in request, $9 million in request, and there was a fight to bring it down to $8 million. But that last year, the expenditure on the same sector was $250 million. So our appetite has ballooned, but have our systems improved whilst we get there? We're in a budgetary cycle, which will begin on Monday, where we have an accrual system of accounting. You say how much money you're going to spend versus how much you expect to receive, and then you come back every year and you do the same exercise, but you don't necessarily have an obligation to account for how you have spent what you have received and what value for money you have. That's a whole of government accounting system, which is really we ought to, where we ought to be. Now, Mr. Dumas would know this better than me, he having served in the public service in the capacities that he has. But our country has, since independence, not sought to fix its institutions in a serious way. Because we can easily say, we need more laws. Tell me about whistleblowing laws. Tell me about campaign financing. Tell me about local government reform. Tell me about any other law that you wish. We need greater penalties. We need more offenses. We need a law for this. We need a law for that. But if you don't fix the system of justice and the system of public accountability, what is the law useful for? We have a robust Proceeds of Crime Act. It's an excellent act. What do we have to show from the Proceeds of Crime Act? We have an excellent Integrity Commission itself. We have an excellent piece of law, the Integrity in Public Life Act. What do we have to show in relation to that? There is prevention of corruption. Laws in Trinidad and Tobago, there are. What do we have to show for that? In Trinidad and Tobago, as Attorney General, I have the privilege of ruling out the government's commitment to certain sectors. And anti-corruption is certainly one of them. It is the main plank because it is for us the main issue which will ensure our survival. Why? The money spent in corruption can easily feed all of our people many times over and take us into the areas of diversification. Diversification has not succeeded in our country, not only because of the curse of oil phenomenon, but also because we've nickel and dime spent our way through diversification. What we spend on advertising for tourism is less than what one hotel brand spends internationally. Take sandals, for instance. Port management, etc. But then there are areas like the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service or the Ministry of National Security, as a country, for the five years 2010 to 2015, we spent $26.7 billion as a government on national security. And we spent for the same period in the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service $15.7 billion for our visitors, divide by six to seven, and you know what the US figure is. So we're throwing a whole lot of money into the equation, but are we seeing the result? We have passed on the parliament floor many laws. I've been in parliament now for seven years, in opposition five years, and in government now two years. And what I can say is that we've got a whole lot of laws, but where are we in terms of progress? So as I move quickly now, having set a little stage drop for you, Let's try and connect some of the dots into the relevance of today's discussion and the way ahead and what the role and facilitation of a government is in this regard. And may I start by saying, from a logistical point of view, the view which this government took was, let's get into the data, let's get into the systems, and let's take this on a commonsensical approach basis. 
Number one, is your criminal justice system working? Let's look at that. I can tell you that for the five years that I sat in opposition, I didn't receive a single scrap of data on the parliament floor. We had esoteric discussions. We talked about what was happening in England and in Canada and in Jamaica and New Zealand and Australia and the rest of the Commonwealth, and this is a great idea here, and the numbers from some other jurisdiction were provided. So the first thing I said, as the manager of my portfolio, let's get our data. We went into the courts, we went into the prisons, we went into the statistical arrangements inside of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, keeping our arm's length carefully. We went into the DPP's office, keeping our arm's length carefully, as constitutionally we must. And so we have 29,090 matters, which are preliminary inquiries, indictable offenses, in arrears in the magistracy, waiting to be taken to the High Court. The case which deals with the largest allegation of corruption, the Piaco Airport Inquiry Matters, started in 2002. We're in 2017. We are in the magistrate's court. Piaco number two, which is the second batch of the preliminary inquiries, is now under judicial review. There's a stay of proceedings application in the magistrate's court. We are now going to go to the high court to see if the magistrate has got it right on a point of bias. After we do the high court, we'll then go to the court of appeal, we'll then go to the privy council, we'll then come back to the magistracy. The two cases may or may not get sent for an indictment by way of committal referral to the DPP. The papers will take two years to move from the DPP to the high court. And two years later, if you're lucky, you start the high court trial. And then we run for several years of high court trial. And then we go to the court of appeal. And then we go to the privy council. And then we may or may not have a retrial. So that's 15 years after the start of the trial. Co-conspirators in the United States have had their trial, pleaded guilty, plea arranged, plea bargained, forfeited assets, and have been released from custody since 2006. So we went to the parliament as our first logical step with the data of our country. 2,157 persons in remand, 1,000 persons in for murder, non-bailable. 90% of the persons, 87% of the persons in remand can't access bail because they don't have the They've been granted bail, can't get out of remand, incarceration, pretrial detention, because they can't afford or have land or other measures to get there. We looked at the magistracy. No rules, no computer system, no rise time, no sit time, no case flow management. We went to the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. We found out eight police prosecutors who are attorneys at law, 23 lawyers across the division, hundreds of thousands of cases in. Magistracy deals with 523,000 odd cases per year. 100,000 of them are traffic offenses. High Court has matters on the criminal side in arrears for 14 years for murder, 17 years for murder, pretrial detention. Cost per prisoner per head, $25,000 per month to keep a man in custody where he didn't pay a parking ticket or he didn't pay maintenance for $12,000. You keep him for a year, you spend $25,000 a month because he didn't pay the $12,000 in maintenance or arrears. But I say it now, some of you nod when I say the statistics because it's the first time we've ruled out those statistics. And as a government, in dealing with corruption, because this is relevant now, if I want to take a charge of corruption, if I want to take somebody down for money laundering, for bid rigging, for certain matters, they have to go through the criminal justice system. So the first order of priority was getting attention to your criminal justice system by dealing with all the input factors. Caseload, number of judges, number of courts, number of prosecutors, counsel of choice versus counsel who is competent, public defense system, computer management software, DNA, forensics, accounting supervision, none of that existed when I came into office in terms of analysis. So first round, one, we have passed plea bargaining legislation. Two, we have passed 
legislation to deal with improved access to bail. Three, we have decriminalized 100,000 traffic offenses to free up magisterial time and police time and remove traffic offenses from the court, convert them to traffic violations instead, where you can focus upon revenue and sanction with due process as may be necessary. We have dealt with judge-only trials because one of the allegations is that a trial by jury takes too long, particularly with the voir dire um, that you can go into, which is a trial within a trial on certain matters of evidence where you traipse the jury in and you traipse the jury out. Then we started and we debated in both houses the abolition of preliminary inquiries. In other words then, let's remove that 17-year cycle, 15-year cycle, as has evidenced itself in the Piaco Airport matter, let the Director of Public Prosecution simply say, indictable offense go to the High Court, summary offense go to the Magistrates Court. The opposition didn't support that. We were told we needed to talk some more. It's only been 26 years of conversation on that. It resembled the response that we got where we were told, let's not abolish child marriages in Trinidad and Tobago because we need to talk some more after 26 years of that. Fortunately, we've now dealt with that particular law and there are no longer child marriages. It should be proclaimed by the 2nd of October. What did we do next? We created a new division of the court because we said the court capacity is a problem. So we took family and children matters. We created two new physical courtrooms, which we're working hard thanks to USAID, thanks to the Canadian government, British government for their advice on the legislative side and support which the criminal justice advisor has given and the United States government in particular for co-funding co some of the arrangements. We did all the court rules. We did all of the court processes. 13,000 people were applicants into the courts and we passed the law to create the division. We amended 18 pieces of law that go with it. We pushed all of that through and therefore, you will now have two courts created, staffed, open, working, protocols in gear, as Richard Blewett, UN DP, can testify. We've done the protocols in relation to data management, etc. We've taken the software system, which we got from Nigeria, improved by Spain, put that into the court system, and you will have had court processes created for the first time in this country's history, all legislation, all positions, and actual outfitting all at the same time within 16 to 18 months. See, we listened to the Jamaican experience of building the plane while you're flying it. And we said that we couldn't do it in sequence, serially. You had to operationalize whilst you were legislating at the same time and make the two meet towards the middle. Next on deck and relevant to this forum is a second package which is, in my view, one which has the potential to change the culture of Trinidad and Tobago. Do laws change culture or does culture change law? That's a very interesting question. We had an interesting experiment with that, of course, where Trinidad and Tobago woke up to the enforcement of the law as it relates to the speed limit when we introduced speed guns. And all of a sudden, we were required to drive at 80 kilometers per hour, and the whole country slowed down. Because paying $6,000 was a little bit hefty. Because you had technology that you couldn't debate. You got a picture, you got a time, that was your number plate, that was your car, you just passed. Pay up. There was certainty of application of law because of an operational enforcement on the ground. That leads me to believe that law can change culture. And it is, it is with that in mind and with the reality that the proceeds of crime, the proceeds of corruption, they only go in three places, and we knew it, cash, businesses, and land. That's it. Cash under your mattress, as we say, it's a local expression, stick it under your mattress. Cash hidden in a vault, cash hidden somewhere. Investment in fronted businesses where you don't know who the real owner is because your beneficial ownership is not certain. You only know the legal owner. 
you're holding it on trust, as Dion referred to a little while earlier, and cash in land, where you engage in the investment, where someone who has committed a corrupt act buys land for you, puts it in their name upon trust for you. That is the package which is coming now, and which has been drafted, and which will start after we finish the budget, because we are bringing forward into law, number one, amendments to the Companies Act, which will treat with a mandatory obligation to disclose beneficial ownership. You have to say who the beneficial owner of your company's shares are. If you don't, it's an offense. An offense is a crime. A crime allows for proceeds of crime to work. And if your court system is now moving a little bit faster, you have a better chance of having the consequence of law applied to you because we have applied the criminal proceedings rules for the first time in the history of this country. And we are computerizing the magistracy for the first time in the history of this country. So we're tracking the workflow whilst we're amending this end. What have we done next? We have drafted, we're completing the final comments right now from public uh, perspective on the Registration of Deeds Bill. It's amendments to the Registration of Deeds Bill Act, the Rail Property Act, the Conveyancing and Loan Property Act, and several other related pieces of law, including the Stamp Duty Act, where we propose to criminalize the failure to register your deed. Why? Because of an abuse of trust. Why? Because there's no mandatory provision in our laws that a trust must be done by way of deed and therefore registered. So we're making it a mandatory obligation that all trusts must be done by deed. Because here's how the system works. A corrupt person engaged in a corrupt contract with a corrupt contractor. Bid rigs, hypothetically, inflates the contract price. The person who gives the contract, who may be management, public service, or politician. Because let's not fool ourselves. Corruption exists where you are nameless and faceless and unaccountable. Wherever there are dark spaces, there's going to be corruption. And I'll tell you what we're doing about that in a short while. So in this hypothetical arrangement, contract is overinflated. The person who has to get the cut gets his end by the contractor who buys a property, puts it in X Limited or in somebody's name, does the purchase, agreement for sale, executes the deed, goes to stamp duty, pays the stamp duty, and then never registers the deed. No problems in the law of Trinidad and Tobago because the equitable ownership trumps the legal ownership, meaning money has passed, the law of equity prevails, your title cannot be defeated because you didn't register, and your biggest jeopardy was the escalation in stamp duty for not having paid it. Because the current law is the maximum penalty that you face for not registering a deed is $2,500 TT whenever you decide to roll up to the registrar and ask for it to be registered. By a little letter, your attorney writes and says, well, you know, I lost the deed and my clerk died and it was sitting in a drawer and it was just pure negligence and mistake of humanity that this thing happened. And yes, I'm sorry, it's 20 years later, but I paid my stamp duty. Here's the deed. We're good to go. Biggest fine you can get, $2,500. 20 years later, that's registered. John Brown rose up and says, well, oh, by the way, we had a trust in place. Here's the copy of the trust. I didn't need to register it. Really, John Brown was holding it for Jane Doe. And I'm unwinding the trust and giving it to Jane Doe. Perfectly lawful transaction. Number one, you don't even know who the people are 20 years later. Number two, $2,500 and you're out. So the government says, must register trusts. You must register your deed within 12 months. And if you can't register your deed, knock on the door of the registry and tell them why. Stamp duty taken long, somebody died, we have an application to make, give notice. Let the registrar consider the application for extension of time. And if the registrar says no, go to the high court. Due process. 
What this means, ladies and gentlemen, is that all of that money that everybody knows about, but nobody knows about, because it's not me, according to the spoken word this morning, I don't know, all of that becomes discoverable. And I genuinely believe that when you're facing down a criminal charge for failure to register, and your equitable ownership must be dis discovered because you must declare the trust by deed. And if it was in a company, you must do it under the company's amendments. Understand what is waiting for us. Now, what I'm describing to you was nowhere in the ministry when I came in. I've never heard it discussed publicly. But I practiced corporate law for around 18 to 20 years. And I'm quite familiar with all of the abuses that can really exist in the white collar realm. Blue collar, white collar, red collar, yellow collar, whatever you want to call it, it's there. And this is what I call the commonsensical approach to tackling corruption. And it makes no sense for us to continue to talk about laws that we're not operationalizing. So let me tell you about the public procurement laws. We came in, we met. I participated in the Joint Select Committee for the Public Procurement Law a whole five years. And upon coming into government, we immediately set about to operationalize the law. We required every state agency, every government ministry to bring their accounts together, create procurement units as the law contemplates. We went to parliament. We amended the terms and conditions packages. We agitated the office of the president so that the president could get about hiring a, a procurement regulator, and that process is due to be finished in a couple of weeks. It's nearly perfected. That law will come into effect, but again, it goes back to the common sense. Well, what's the good of the law if the system I work in? Which is why we spent our first round of time dealing with the procedural and logistical crimin criminal justice arrangements. And I want to give an open salutation to the judiciary and to the DPP's office and the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service for being willing participants in the reform process that we have achieved because it has been outstanding. Does the country have faith that they're going to see something yet? Faith requires example to give hope. The political cycles are a lot shorter than the economic realities of our country. The world has shown us that political certainty is an uncertainty. You never quite can con configure in advance what a political result is going to be. But our society needs to withstand the political vagaries by improving our systems. And in tandem with this approach, as we deal with the compulsory registration of land, because we have a land package to treat with the compulsory registration of land, so that your title is now guaranteed and we know who the owners are with certainty as we operationalize laws which have sat on the books since the year 2000, unassented, unproclaimed, as we operationalize that to work with the registration of deeds, to work with the beneficial ownership. We're also talking about creation of a new criminal division, which I expect to be able to lay on the parliament floor, which will mirror what we did in the family and children division as an example of successful reorientation of our criminal justice system. But it doesn't stop there, because the Ministry of Finance has been heavily engaged in what we will take to Parliament in a matter of months, which is the Revenue Authority. Because our system of revenue collection and inspection has not been treated with, and systemically it's completely broken. And we are in the process of operationalizing by discussions with the trade unions, by discussion with the workers, the transformation of the Board of Inland Revenue into the Revenue Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. So we're building it out on the ground right now, and the law will come to meet it in or around November of this year, when the Revenue Authority legislation is taken to Parliament. See, we're not waiting again upon Trinidad's cycle of passing a law as we did with public procurement, and then seven years later, we're talking about whether it's implemented or not. We've just implemented the DNA legislation. It's been on the books of Trinidad and Tobago since the year 2000. 17 years later, we now have a DNA regulator. We're now talking about the population of the DNA register. 
And we're talking about massive cost savings because we have the entire arrangement to put into place. DNA analysis for all inmates, convicted or remanded. DNA analysis and profiling for all persons in the protective services and government services who would be involved in that arena so you can discount their DNA if it's on a crime scene. That's 1,000 arrestees per month. That's 5,000 incarcerated persons. That's, that's 7,000 persons in the public service in the TTPS alone added into that mix. So you get a populated DNA database, and it can be done within a six to 10-week period. I'm talking fast, but I'm reflecting upon facts. I'm not telling you about what is to come. I'm telling you about what is happening at the same time that we do the legislative tweaks and fixes. So that is revenue management. Out of revenue management comes corruption. The Auditor General is here. He will tell you that we're working on significant amendments at the Auditor General's office, that we're working on dismantling, through consultative process, Section 4 of the Board of Inland Revenue Act with the agitation that the Auditor General can have certain access provisions to data to cross-check and match. Again, that's a requirement coming out of the OECD as you get, would be familiar, and also something which is pursuant to our bilateral and multilateral relationships under our tax obligations, be they FATCA or Global Forum. So there is a multidimensional fix going on literally all at the same time. And it's not often that one gets the pleasure of, as Dion put it, he reflecting upon how I put it, of connecting the dots. They are all interrelated. It does require the agitation of NGOs such as this body in continuously demanding a reformative process through positive advocacy. Enough is enough. Productivity is required. Honesty is required. We're in a very austere environment. Everybody understands the need for productivity in an austere environment. Yesterday we heard from the chairman of Prestige Holdings that they're in one of their restaurant holdings that they have a 40% absenteeism rate in Trinidad and Tobago where having a job is a privilege in an austere environment. You have a 40% absenteeism rate. And we have public service matters listed at the commissions which are 17 years in arrears. 15 years in arrears. The last court martial conducted in Trinidad and Tobago was 13 years ago because no judge advocate was appointed. We went through the listing and we will start the process because we went into the Defense Council, the Pardons Committee. Nothing was operationalized for a very long time. And I want to give you the assurance that your government is working extremely hard in the process. And it's a joy to work with the public service who, through a little bit of tone setting from the top, sleeve rolling, getting down into the trenches and working, have met the challenge and have risen to the occasion to execute as is appropriate in these circumstances. I could spend a whole day telling you a little bit more. I want to tell our spoken word this morning, excellent product. Our greatest battle in Trinidad and Tobago is everybody is well informed. Everybody knows what everybody should be doing. Everybody knows when a crime goes down, but nobody gives evidence because evidence is dangerous. And yes, our whistleblowing legislation has passed through a joint select committee which did not complete its exercise. And therefore, what we did was to take the product coming out of the 15 sessions of the joint select committee amend the legislation, and it will be reintroduced into Parliament now. But whistleblowing legislation takes you so far. It's the confidence in seeing your systems operate that take us to where we go. I will end by giving congratulations to the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service for noticeable improvement in certain areas. It seems to be lost upon many, or perhaps it's a whisper that we don't want to fracture, but I'm heartened to see alleged kidnappers caught in quick time, persons who commit murders allegedly, now before the courts, 
a matter of days or weeks after the event has been carried out. The police arresting the police, as we saw, that is not lost upon me. It shows that the call to work and the encouragement that you have a government supporting all institutions is beginning to take root. All that I can ask for is patience. We're not deaf to the cries, but the Prime Minister has given a very careful caution to us all. Get your job performed and talk when you have something to say and demonstrate the proof of your product lest you be quick in the gab and poor in the performance. You will see a lot of unveiling as we begin to come to midterm now because we've done the work and the work will speak for itself but it requires participation. May I congratulate the organizers of today's event for its continued role and performance. The Global Competitive Index yesterday um, demonstrated Trinidad and Tobago's improvement by 11 points from 93 to 84, moving upwards in the rankings based upon the work that we did in 2016, as it's reflected there. We're headed in the right direction. Our work in the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force has been outstanding. Our partners who are aware of what we're doing in money laundering and counterterrorism um, and financing of terrorism can, can speak to the excellent work that has gone on. We have quadrupled, quintupled the work product and we're headed in the right direction. We owe a debt of gratitude to each and every person who has contributed to this, clause, to this cause, including our international partners and friends as the Australians, the Canadians, the British, and many others have been, the UNDP, a strong participant as well. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing me the privilege of addressing you this morning. Please again accept my apology for trying to make cabinet in four minutes' time, um, but fortunately, it's not too far away. And with your permission, I will do as we do in Trinidad, not having had something to eat, but I will use our expression, I'm doing like Spanish and running after the event. So thank you so much for your attention and your care and courtesy. Thank you.